Welcome, dear friends, to this, the sixth session of our retreat, Reflecting on Paintings. When you read the four Gospels, you notice that the longest narrative about Jesus in all the Gospels is the narrative of his passion and death. And you notice that the camera doesn't stay always on Jesus. In the Passion narrative, you meet all sorts of people and you watch a litany of different reactions to Jesus. And we're talking not only about the Passion of Jesus, we're talking too about the Passion of Discipleship. They have their own story at the heart of this, a story of separation and loss and flight. Many of the characters you meet have different reactions to Jesus. In this reflection, I'm going to take the reaction of one woman. She only gets a line in Matthew's Gospel, and that's Pilate's wife. So I've chosen this painting by a young French artist, and it's entitled Pilate's Doubt. And I've entitled this reflection Hat Trick. Dear onlooker, please don't laugh at my ten-gallon moleskin hat. It was a birthday present from my husband Pontius Pilate, or Ponte as I call him when the servants are not listening. The hat came all the way from Rome in a crate with the imperial stamp, Tiberius Imperator, sovereign delivery across the great sea. I thought it might contain another dreary imperial bust for Ponty's study, but no, an imperial headache for me. Apparently, the onlookers, it's the latest fashion in Rome, but I suspect it looks a tad ridiculous in this cheerless outpost of Judea. Being fashionable in this wilderness is hardly an achievement. I mean, who's going to notice? Forgive me for talking about my hat. Sometimes it's the irrelevant that dominates. Dear Ponte reckons that Caiaphas, the high priest, who has a wardrobe of lustrous fabrics, would love to have my hat adorn his head. Personally, I think that Caiaphas, our dreary, pushy Pontifex Maximus, needs bigger goals in life. Anyway, dear onlooker, forget the hat. Because of its tiny size and paltry revenue, Judea is a third-class imperial province. And everyone knows that the governors of these provinces are drawn from the equestrian ranks, like Ponte, which means they emerge from the lower stratum of nobility. Against all family advice, I admit, I took a spectacular dive from the heights of Roman aristocracy. Remember, I am a granddaughter of an emperor, now ending up in the shallow end when I married Ponte. Oh, I don't regret marrying the dear man. But I never dreamed I would be reduced to visiting this brutal outpost. Caesarea, not Jerusalem, is our normal home. We live with our back to the country we dominate, facing out to the great sea, dreaming of faraway Rome. You can see the grand city built by Herod the Great, who moved the capital from Jerusalem to Caesarea to put the ambitious priests in their place. It's much cooler, much more classical than Jerusalem. I love the harbour above all, our getaway to Rome. Do you see it? 
The best thing is that you never see a priest in Caesarea. The locals are forbidden to set foot in our pagan outpost. Thank the gods for small mercies. In Judea, the wilderness dominates everything. When you travel around the province, you always seem to be between a rock and a hard place. I often wonder, dear onlookers, if the geography were kinder, would the people be more tolerant and less quarrelsome? There's too much light, too many vacant spaces, too much sadness and too much religion. Usually I don't stand in front of my husband as you see me do in this painting. In the plodding round of ordinary time, what we Romans call tedia vitae, I travel around this God-forsaken land, dutifully three steps behind the governor, like the timorous wife in the shadow of the macho lord, acknowledging the leftover smiles people vouchsafe me after he has passed by. No such being in Judea as a woman in her own right. Who you are is not established by your wit or wisdom, but what kind of man you're attached to. A woman is nothing without a male member. Ponte is the military governor. I am the appendage to political correctness, his flamboyant cufflinks. I am a woman longing to be a mother, married to a career politician, longing for upgrade. Ponte is not a bad man, really, dear onlooker, and I do love him in my own peculiar way but he just cannot compete over here with all these professional politicians dressed up in the vestments of priests. Here, I believe priests learn strategy from the cradle, imbibed it from their mother's breasts, while Ponte was playing snooker back in Rome in the taverns of Via Aurelia. Not that he is wholly naive, just out of his league. He's one of those civil servants unblessed with sharp intelligence and ability. His brilliant mentor, Sejanus, and the Roman Senate have rewarded him by stuffing him with useless honours. Promoted beyond his competence, he is, to be honest made important only by the gift of others. Ponte's authority depends on being appointed by the Senate. Only a matter of time, I guess, before he is disappointed. A few hours ago, he handed over the prisoner, Jesus of Nazareth, to be crucified. Even though he declared the man to be innocent, three times bawling his judgment into deaf ears, trying to cajole the crowd with reasonableness. But he gave in to them. How dumb is that, I ask you? I argued with him, you are the Imperium, the supreme power in this place. Authorities rule, they do not intercede with mobs. How can you, as a governor, pronounce judgment and then proceed within minutes to ignore it? Poor Ponte. When the chief priest shouted, we have no king but Caesar, I could see Ponte visualising himself dismissed by Tiberius for treason. What annoyed me most about Ponte was that he ignored the recurring dream I shared with him, morning after morning, about this Jesus of Nazareth. In my dreams, the image that repeated itself over and over again 
was of Jesus in the body of a lamb, dismissing hundreds of wild boars over a cliff somewhere into the Sea of Galilee. The wild boar is the image on the standards of the 10th legion. Legion was dismissed while the lamb was unvanquished. And then suddenly, without warning, the image changed. The lamb lay captured, its legs tied, looking helpless, awaiting slaughter. But by whom? By whom? By whom? When I asked that question, I always woke up. He may not be a lamb, but Jesus is no terrorist. I told Pontes, no threat to the power of Rome. That indeed was the conclusion of the reports submitted by our own intelligence people. Secretive, attentive men. They recommended a public lashing, some street theatre, to keep the priests off our backs. In fairness, Ponte did try that, but the crowds were ravenous for more blood, and the priest's anger was not assuaged. I tried to dissuade my husband from his decision. You can see me in this painting walking away from this all-male firestone as I lay my hand in resignation and defeat on the shoulder of my maidservant. The crowds demanded the final solution and their contemptible critic be crucified to death. In the end, Ponte washed his perfumed hands of the whole affair and yielded to their demands so much for Roman justice. And there you see the governor in this painting dressed in Venetian maroon, his favourite colour, with me in matching outfit. Don't you think we make a handsome couple? We're standing in Herod's old palace, the one he built for himself, the old codger, now our official residence, while we're here in Jerusalem. Ponte's face is Japanese white, in spite of the overbearing sun here. Although you will have noticed that the sun has somehow been cancelled. We're all in the dark, even though it's three o'clock in an afternoon of a normal Friday. What's happening with climate change these days? I had to get the servants to light the candles. Ponte and I are here in the lookout room of the palace. From the lookout room, you can see over the whole city of Jerusalem. You've noticed I know the cross behind me, outside the window on Golgotha. I've turned away from the window. Golgotha is outside the main western gate of the city a handy place to terminate those who scorn our laws or vex authority, and in this case, my husband. Everyone who enters and leaves the Western Gate has to pass by the exhibition gallery on Golgotha. This is great Roman advice. If you want to preside over a populace, make sure the criminals are seen to suffer, to terrify those who follow in their wake. It's a Roman law. Violence should be visible. What's the point of crucifying people on a green hill far away? Who's to see? From the window I watch the whole sad theatre of the absurd. Ponte 
sat in a corner not daring to look at his handiwork. I watched Jesus stumble up the rock carrying his cross. I watched the king stagger like a drunken slave, then keel over, smashing into the rock face before he's whipped to upright again. He flounders, rises, spits dust, lurches, manages the few paces left before his journey's end is reached. He falls down again, this time to greet the ground like an old friend he has waited too long to see. If I am not mistaken, I saw him kiss the rock he fell upon. The hired carpenter moves in, stretches Jesus' leg, stretches his legs on the cross to attach flesh to wood and nail the body precisely according to the instructions he has been given. Jesus' body stretches and stiffens into line. The sound of hammering echoes loudly against the rocks. Carpenter nails carpenter to lumber. The ritual almost complete. The body is raised in place. That done, the carpenter stands back to admire his crippling handiwork. No need for adjustments, he reckons. Text, book, clean. Then after wiping some blood from his face, the carpenter packs his tools and makes for home. Another job well done. Where, I wonder, will he go home to? Watching all this, I notice for the first time there's no silence on Golgotha. The street dogs yawn and growl impatiently, crouching, ready to attack torn flesh. This man, they know, can shoo nothing away. Soldiers slap armour and joke about their last conquest. The street vendors are so busy, they cry their bargain prices of nibbles to the tourists at the crucifixion. They linger to look, these tourists whisper to each other, glad they have elsewhere to go. Overhead the buzzards hover, their fury in check, winging their incessant circles as they hold out for that dead bulk and wait to give before they dive and rend human rubble. The demented women, always women, now look, now look away, avoiding each other's eyes then draw their damp veils around their faces to mop up useless tears for their lovers, family, friends. They keep the habit of years turning up in dangerous places to observe the brute theatre of male violence. I watch them kill time, waiting for the soldiers' permission before they're allowed to move in and pick up the pieces. I absorb the details alone at the window. I see this Jesus, my husband's chosen victim in the middle, yes, of the universe. I hear the chief priests shout their taunts, sweet victory in every swollen phrase. For a moment, was I dreaming? I thought the crucified Jesus looked up at the tower from his cross, sought out the window where I stood, and held me, Pilate's wife, in his gaze, his eyes 
drilling my soul. The bruised eyes close, the head collapses onto the chest, the body pitches forward, the makeshift crown of thorns loses its grip and drops like some skewered starship falling to the ground. Then the sudden silence now all around. With darkness having descended like a safety curtain, nature puts morning on. Only the cross seems lit from within. I turn away into the room and Ponte gets up and stands behind me, feeling for my waist like a blind man who somehow knows it's dark for everyone. Pilots doubt. That is why I front this painting, dear onlooker, with Ponte off centre in the shadows. There are times when women have to take centre stage because the men have sadly lost it. And from what I hear of Jesus' followers, the same story is being acted out in that camp. Poor Ponte. Oh, I know that you will remember him for all the wrong reasons, or for the one reason. I fear he will go down in history as the dithering Roman governor who executed the innocent Galilean prophet. He will be summarized, I'm sure, by the blunder he made, suffered under Pontius Pilate. That will be his only entry into who's who in history. To get back to the hat, you notice how the crucifixion of Jesus has impressed itself on my hat like some imperial logo. I am not a woman easy to impress, but clearly this Jesus has impressed himself on me. Can you see him? On my imperial hat. Never mind Veronica's veil. Take in the hat. Do you see it? If he was indeed the Son of God, not just a slaughtered lamb. I think the poet has it right, the one who wrote Hedgehog, finishing with these lines as I do. The hedgehog gives nothing away, keeping itself to itself. We wonder what a hedgehog has to hide, why it so distrusts we forget the God under this crown of thorns. We forget that never again will a God trust in the world.